think we ran into Ryan probably close to 10 years ago. And uh, we always had a great time when you came on. You're very open, honest. Uh, you've certainly been down a few roads and uh, coming back. Ryan is a uh, program ambassador for a recovery community called Transcend, also a chairman of the Focused in uh, Intensity Foundation, raises scholarship money for individuals who attend rehab who can't afford it. It's great to see you. You look great. You uh, brought your girlfriend. Looks like you got life in order here. Right? Today. Yeah. Today I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if you were going to recap the last four years for somebody who had no idea about Ryan Leaf, how, how would you recap four years? Well, um, interesting. Um, I have a lot of life experience, even more added on to all this. Um, I think that four years ago, um, I got sick. And when I got sick, I got offered pain medication from the doctor and I never told him that I had a previous problem. I just had to do radiation for a brain tumor. And I just assumed that, you know what? Everybody else gets to do this when they're feeling this. And I, but I can't, I can never take one. And I, it, they gave me those pills December 1st, 2012. And by March 30th, 2000, or December 1st, 2011, by March 30th, 2012, I was in a jail cell. So it took four months for everything to go away. But how, when you took one, then you had to have another, I mean, you had to maintain the high? No, I just, it just became psychological. And then also I was trying to hide it from everybody. And I was out there telling everybody, you know, you can just ask for help. You can just ask for help. But I was pretty much just, just uh, you know, do what I say, not what I do type of thing. And that was just shameful and guilt ridden. I felt like a hypocrite. Well, you were doing a book tour. Exactly. And I don't know if I, I hated shilling for something that, that bothered me. I wish I could have just told my story and not been like, yeah, now buy my book. I don't like that part of it. And it's difficult to do. It's a fine edge sword. Um, but I'm trying to make sure that it's always going to be about somebody other than me now. Helping somebody else, being of service, not directly affecting me or having to tell people how well I'm doing. Because that's not what I want. I, don't, I could care less if people still think I'm in jail or I'm on Skid Row or anything like that. That's, that's not the important part. The important part is that I'm, I'm here and I'm saying, hey, we have a solution um, and I, I can try to help with you with that. How bad did it get? Well, I got bad enough that I was willing to walk into people's homes and take their pills. That's a morality point of that is uh, I can't believe that. I've never really been uh, affected by law enforcement ever in my life, and yet I was willing to do that. And I think the best thing that ever happened to me was being put in jail. I was resentful of it for quite a while, but there comes a point when you accept that, you know what, the best thing that happened was that. And that's hard to say, but it's true. What was jail like? It was like adult daycare. You know, they put a 15-inch flat screen at the end of your bed with 45 channels and as a babysitter. And could you watch this show? I could. <laughs> I have always enjoyed your show. <laughs> well, you were in touch with Paulie. Yes, sir. The day you got arrested. Yes, sir. You, I, again, you emailed him. You were thinking about a documentary on your life. Yeah. I was out of my mind. I don't want a documentary in my life. I don't want to do that. But of course, I felt like I had to keep up the charade of what my life had become now. Now it was this guy who got it right, and now he's going to tell everybody about mm -hmm. it. It was just, like I said, hypocritical. And it's tough. It's fraudulent. And I don't necessarily know what I was doing at that moment. I had publicists. I mean, it was, that's, I don't want to be that guy anymore. I want to be able to enjoy uh a weekend in San Francisco, maybe do a little stuff to bring awareness, but not make it all about me. And I've really gotten an opportunity to see old friends uh, such as yourselves and a lot of peers that have just kind of welcomed me back in open arms. And Well, you'd be surprised how many people, like addicts are great at fooling people, or they think they we are. think we are, yes. And, and that's, like, we, we were concerned, but you were telling me all the right thing. When we went to lunch that day, we, we thought maybe there was something there, but I didn't know to add what, what magnitude, but it felt like you were telling me what I wanted to hear that day. Is that true? Well, I was with you guys in November, so about, yeah, I was about, down, about to go down that road about three weeks from there. Yeah. I can tell you when it was, when I sat with you guys, was in the, uh, at the Super Bowl in Indianapolis. We went, should have been the, great, should have been the greatest uh, night. Um, Polly asked me to come along to Adam Sandler's showing 
of Big Daddy or uh, that. Who's, who's your daddy? Uh, that's 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 my boy, right? That's I my think. boy or yeah. something, yeah. <laughs> or who's your daddy? No, who's your daddy? Yeah. Yeah. It's about him. That's my it. next one with Sandler, who's your and, daddy? And uh, I got to sit next to him, and he got to look at me and see when I laughed, and I got to interact with the guy, but I was so, my mind was so wrapped up with, like, I can't wait to get back to the hotel to take my pills. I mean, that's where I was, and I was in this great environment. Troy Aikman was there, you know. Yeah, there are a lot of people. Jason there. Garrett. Um, Ciara was there. I don't know if she was there. Yeah, she was. Believe me. You see, again, I was messed up. <laughs> um, but when you took that pill, what did you feel? Well, I, I felt like I deserved it, which is oh, wow. silly uh, because I was going through some kind of hardship. You know, life, is, life isn't fair. It's just how you deal with it that matters. And I simply didn't know how to deal with life um, well enough still. But did you feel sorry for yourself because of what happened with your football career that here you go, number two in the draft. Uh, Peyton is one of the greatest of all time, and you're unemployed. Now, did that ever, did it, did it start to eat away at your confidence level, your ego, self esteem? I don't know. Of course. I don't think it, I don't think it could. I felt like a failure, but what other people think of me is none of my business. It's an affirmation I have to live by every morning, and I try to, and it's taken forever for me to get through that part of it. But the acceptance of that has helped, you know, transcend. Uh, me to this new plane. And like I told you now, I I'm okay today. You know, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. We'll wake up and do that, that tomorrow with the same process. Uh, I know I'm in a very stable environment in Los Angeles where there is just an unbelievable recovery community. Play a lot of golf, get out in nature. It's like a five hour meditation for me. Look at you. So uh, I really, really have also, it's almost been four years. So that chemical is out of my body. I've never been that clean for the last, you know, 10 years of my life. Have you been close to it? I worked in a sober living house when I got out, and I was in charge of medication, and I had to distribute them to other clients. And that was the biggest test. And it was like... It it's was, like a bartender being an alcoholic. Right. It was a pretty pretty cool event. Not only did I have some accountability, but I had people I could go to when I, like, when I looked at them, and I said, hey, you know, I, I got through this. And the people, the support team is, is a huge part of it. We're talking to Ryan Leaf, a former number two pick in the draft. What was that, 1998? 1998. 1998. Um, I know that everybody's going to be an armchair therapist with Johnny Manziel. What do you see? And being fair to him, because you wouldn't want somebody to do that to you, but if you look at Manziel, warning signs there, what would concern you? I, I, I said this yesterday. It feels like I'm holding up a mirror. I, when I hear oh, some boy. stories come out, I just go, oh, my God, I did that. That's how I behaved. I'd like to say that my substance abuse was the reason why I played poorly, but I didn't start <laughs> using drugs until after I retired. <laughs> so I, could, I, can't bl I can't blame it on that. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't play well. Um, so it's, it's a different, uh, different dynamic that I don't know about, P trying to be an NFL quarterback and then maybe having some of these substance abuse issues. He says he's fine. Um, He's been to treatment. I don't know what for. I think that was a... When I mean, this happened last year, I thought that was the greatest thing. Imagine if I would have done that just to go get behavioral counseling when I was in my second year when things were falling off the rails. And I thought, wow, that's a great thing. And sometimes things just start to spiral. And maybe a year, you got to be out of football for a year. you got to get your stuff right because though this is a great game and it's an institution in this country, it's fleeting. It's gone in a second. Everybody's not like Peyton Manning who can play 18 seasons. Well, the dangerous part is you think your talent... Or your personality or ego can get you through this. Like, I can handle that. You, you've handled everything else, adversity. You know, Manziel handled the SEC. Right. Well, of course I can handle this. And that's when you start to give that false sense of belief. That's exactly how I was, too. When things started to go bad and I started fighting with the media and then my teammates, I was like, you know, I'm the big, strong football player. There's no vulnerability in me. I can figure this out. Leave me alone. And you just can't win that fight. You know, you're, you're playing the best defenses every weekend and then fighting the media all week long. It's just exhausting. Your central nervous system is on tilt for about every day for 20 hours. Would you want to do a documentary now? I, if it could help people get into substance abuse treatment and get into mental health treatment. I know Brandon Marshall is coming on next. He's a big advocate for that. And, um, you know, I got to spend a lot of time watching you I guys. Think it would help. I think it would help. It would help agree. people. I agree. I think it'd be cathartic for you as well. I think you'd realize. I'm worried about my family because they live in a small town. And every time I do anything, regardless of the impact, 
it's on the front page of the newspaper uh, back home. It's a small town. And my father is just is a man of such integrity in his work and what he's done in this in this society as well as my uh, in that community as well as my mother. Now my little brother's back there working and stuff. So I don't they just love that I have a peaceful, unchaotic life and that may do something. But it might control. be nice that it, they get a positive headline there instead of a negative one. True. Um, I don't necessarily know if there ever will be positive headlines. No, I think there can be. But uh, you get you you have you have a good story. It is, and that's the point. And that's what all, you're alive. You're here, so it's a good story. And that's the question. People ask me why you continue to do this. You know, um, you you've said this before, and I said, well, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to just quit? Am I am I supposed to just give it up? Because I was at a point where I was just going to give it up. You know, I had just left my brother. I'd slipped my wrist. I was in the. This was after I talked to Polly. I was in my truck pulling into a. Uh, um, a garage to just park and kill yourself. Yeah. And that's the mindset. You think there's no way out. There's no support. And Johnny may be same way. He might be just going, there's no one out there to help me, but he's probably got so many people who unconditionally love him. who will just wrap their arms around him. They may love the idea of Johnny Manziel, but they may not know that they may not know the person, the ones that unconditionally love him. They do. And those are the ones that want to wrap their arms around him. And he's just, He's pushed everybody away, probably like, I can deal with this on my own. Because I did it. And that's why I say there's a mirror when I look at it. What stopped you from going in that garage? My parents were home. They were, they were supposed to be at grandparents' house, um, taking care of them because of the new story that broke. And I just saw it. I pulled a U-turn and instead went out and found another house and got arrested again. Found more pills. I said, I, I, I can't deal with this unless I'm high. I can't kill myself because I'm a coward. So I need to be high. And I went and found more pills. And then luckily, the, you know, when I asked God for help, you know, this time he sent the sheriffs. That's the only difference. Because uh, if they don't come. You know, if they don't come, my little brother was there to take care of me. But I needed that. I needed to be intervened with. So I'm grateful for that, for sure. Stay in touch, all right? I will. And if you get dark... You know, we'll do something stupid to cheer you up, all right? I know you will. I appreciate it. We do that. it every single day. <laughs> He's uh, Ryan Leaf, the uh, program ambassador for a recovery community. It's called Transcend, also the chairman of the Focused Intensity Foundation, which raises scholarship money for individuals to attend rehab who can't afford it. Good to see you, man. Thank you. It's can great you, to see you. Can you give us 60 yards? I probably can't get you six yards, but I can try. <laughs> Actually, I probably could throw it a little ways. Right you now. probably you can. Yeah, you yeah. can spin it a little bit. Here. I still can, yeah. All right, we'll go outside and see what you got here. Maybe you can knock down McLovin. <laughs> oh, I don't want to do that. Yes, we want that. He, he almost killed You don't Paul. have a helmet this time, do you? What now? He had a helmet last time, remember? Oh, we can put a helmet on it. <laughs> <laughs>